Stephen McCabe, an Irish-American priest, departed from his home in Massachusetts in 1949, on the first stage of a trip to his ancestral home in County Cavan. Father McCabe was going on a pilgrimage to Ireland, led by Cardinal Spellman. Scores of Irish-Americans were making the trip back to Ireland. The pilgrims were travelling by liner from Boston. Their destination, Cove in County Cork. My garden of Eden has vanished, they say, but I know the line of it still. And In order to have a souvenir of his first trip to Ireland, Father McKay brought with him a movie camera. With this camera, he was to record his first impressions of a land his father had left behind as he had joined tens of thousands of Irish people seeking a new life in America. The voyagers were welcomed in Cove by enormous crowds who cheered the pilgrims ashore. An official itinerary lay ahead, including visits to Knock and Crookpatrick, as well as government receptions in Dublin. But for Father McCabe, his own private pilgrimage would bring him to Killin Care in County Cavan, and the home of Rose Lynch, his first cousin. With his camera on this trip and on two others over the following six years, Father McCabe filmed a homemade documentary of life in rural Ireland 30 years ago. He filmed all he saw around him, the people, their homes, their work and their leisure. He filmed the children. He went to the local national school in Kill and Care and filmed the pupils playing in the schoolyard. Today, over 30 years later, Father McCabe returns to the same school. It is now a ruin, closed down with some other small schools in the area to make way for a new Kill and Care school. Across the road from the old school is the new school building. This program is about what became of those pupils filmed 30 years ago, what they made of their lives, where they are today. And through talking to some of the 70 pupils at Killin Care National School in 1954 and their teachers, we may discover how a rural community has responded to the great changes that have taken place over the last 30 years. Kilincare is a small townland in the south of County Cavan. It is about halfway between Virginia and Baileyborough. The land is typical Cavan land, Drumlin country, low hills and hollows, for the farmer difficult and sometimes dangerous to work, but not impossible. The low land is often boggy. The drainage on the hills provides the best land. There's no village of Killincare. It's a name on a map. It has two churches, a hall, a post office, but no shops, no pubs and no main street. You're never sure you're in it until you've passed through it. 30 years ago, the land was the same. Then as now, slow to allow a man and his family to make a good living. A land reluctant to yield a good harvest to the man with the plough. One of the former pupils at the National School, Jerry Clark, remembers what it was like for his father farming 40 acres. Down through the years, uh, cabin farmers uh, living on mediocre land and small holdings like they had no option but to be industrious and thrifty and uh, I think that was inbred into them to try as many projects as possible on the land and gradually people came to various enterprises like in, when we were growing up we had uh, half a dozen different em enterprises on the farm there was potatoes, oats, pigs, poultry and uh, all at farmyard level and I think uh, that reflects the the, the situation in most farms in this area. I don't think they had any option because, you know, we, had, we didn't have the good tracts of land that they have in County Meath and Kildare and we had to try everything that was going. An outsider remembers what his first impressions of Killin Care were. 
Brendan Ryan, a young Mayo man, came to Killancare National School in the 1950s to take up his first teaching post. My first impression was that it was a quiet, peaceful place because I went there in the month of July and uh, it was a rolling countryside with uh, blooming hedgerows. Uh, it looked a little bit lazy, uh, very few people. And when I got to know the people there, I found that, well, I found that they were quiet. They were small farmers. They were not terribly ambitious in terms of material wealth, not terribly ambitious in terms of making money. Their ambition related more to just making enough for a living. The people seemed content, the people seemed happy, uh, in spite of the fact that they hadn't any material wealth. The farms were small, the land was poor, they worked very, very hard. They got up early in the morning, they worked in summertime until late in the evening. The people may not have been ambitious, but a living had to be made. By the age of 13 or 14, most of the pupils had finished their formal education. Brendan Kelly, headmaster of Virginia Vocational School, has been teaching in the area for over 30 years. He remembers what it was like in the mid-50s. At that particular time in 1954, it was very limited where a student could go. In actual fact, second level education was, uh, it was, in many cases, even though there's would like to go, it was just beyond them, financially and otherwise, because of the fact that they would have had to go to Caffin Town and become boarders, or else they would have had to physically cycle to Kells, uh, Old Castle, and uh, you're talking about in some cases a journey of 12 miles, 15 miles, Old Castle from, for some of them would have been 8 to 10 miles, and then you had the financial strain of going to Cavan Town or wherever, like it could be Dublin or wherever they wanted to go for second level. So for the vast majority of them, it just wasn't on, except for those who were very well off. With such limited opportunities for second level schooling, the majority of pupils were forced to find a living from a very young age. A combination of limited education and a depressed economy meant that opportunities were very poor. They just seemed to drift. They seemed to live at home for perhaps three or four years. They left. Some of them remained on at school beyond the age at which children normally leave school nowadays. Many of them went on to 14 years of age. They did their uh, statutory stint at school. Uh, they often just hung around. It seemed that they seemed to hang around at home. Uh, after that, they disappeared, and you might have heard afterwards that somebody was in America or somebody was in Dublin or somebody was in Cavan or in Bedford or in Virginia working in a garage or working in a shop. One of those who found himself drifting from one dead-end job to another was PJ Gillick. He was the son of the local postman. Uh, I worked for uh, Jack Kellis in Oldcastle, people who make the bed and furniture. Huh? And I, he left me off after a certain amount of time when I was working for a farmer and I cut turf on the bog and I done several bits and pieces like that and then I went to England. Well, there was nothing about at that particular time for anybody, not just for me, but every young fellow at the time, there, there was nothing. Nobody had anything and there was no employment of any kind. The jobs vacant pages in the newspapers were full of offers of employment in Britain. There was a shortage of labour in a booming post-war English economy. For some of the pupils, advertisements in the newspapers offered hope of escape from dead-end jobs. Mary Gaffney, now Mary McCall, remembers how she was tempted. So I went to work in Dublin for a while. Uh, then I went back home. I was there about six months, just a temporary. Then I went back home and I worked in the vets for two or three months. And then I think it was in the Irish press, there was a, an advertisement for a job in Birmingham in the hospital. So I'll come over there. Many of the boys and girls leaving the National School faced the prospect of having to leave the area. The child most likely to remain was the eldest son who might hope to inherit the farm. But the farms were small and even the eldest son sometimes found he had to go away. I went because uh, there wasn't much on the farm at the time, you know, there was probably six, seven cows you're milking and 
40, 50 acres, 45. And the brothers had been in England during the, the holidays when they were school, you know. So I went to, to make money. And uh, didn't really make money either, you know, just a few hundred pounds, I suppose, but at the time. Didn't really like it, you know. As the young adults left the area, many of those who stayed behind were children and old people. In any community with heavy emigration of those with the most energy and enthusiasm, this was bound to have a depressing effect on those left behind. But like the, the fact was that uh, children, like the families were moving out, were being split up, so therefore it, it was a difficult period for them. And uh, rather sad in the sense that uh, like families, seven, eight of a family, there might be only one left, one left to, take, to carry on the tradition in the farming community, and that was it, or the rest of the move out. <laughs> were big, children were almost bred for export. With a large family, you could expect several to emigrate and yet still have enough left at home. In hard times, money coming back from children in England or America could help. Even in good times, it allowed the purchase of luxuries. Mrs. Gaffney and her husband raised a large family in a tiny county council cottage. In 1954, she had six of her children attending Killincare National School. Yet that was less than half of her family. I had 14 children, one dead. Uh, one uh, emigrated. To Australia, another emigrated to America, uh, five, six into England, five in Ireland, there's just one left at home. And then this boy left it when he was 20, or 22, to Australia. And the other, Nora, emigrated to America, she was 15, to go to school to finish her education. And uh, the other ones, well, left at different stages, different stages, to go to England, one after the other. I always felt that I'd have some of them left at home. They wouldn't all go. 